It's a friendly question. <laughs> Great talk. Um, you said this thing is happening slowly as, and uh, with big disasters not happening, but there have been cases of uh, like a storm, major storm surge in the Bay of Bengal can easily result in over 100,000 dead and has Absolutely. done in the past, except because the dead people were poor, it only got on the back page of the newspapers. Yes. So that, that's a... And my own family was flooded out in the mm. Thames floods. But the other part of the question, that wasn't a question, that was, that was you've said um, sea level rise is inevitable and the mechanisms that you've, you've gone into very, very nicely show that we can't do anything... We can't solve sea level rise simply by... Uh, reducing emissions or getting rid of global warming by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But what um, is it possible to estimate um, what fraction of sea level rise is actually related directly to, to warming due to greenhouse gases and what fraction of it would continue if we sort of beat, uh, beat the greenhouse gases by taking CO2 out of the atmosphere? Well, you know, again, you probably could figure this as well or better than I can, but the truth is, you know, if you look at the correlation of carbon dioxide levels, temperature, and, and sea level, and again, it's not necessarily true that it'll be linear or, or relational, I should say, but the fact that we're 40% higher in greenhouse gases and that we're warming, we've already warmed a degree and even the most aggressive conferences to stop the, stop the warming, say, let's keep it to two degrees, another degree above present, or, you know, and, or maybe a half a degree, and so on in the debate. So the fact is that, uh, as, you, as you well know, we don't know exactly where we can stop the warming, but, again, we have feet in the, I like to say, in the pipeline. There's water in the pipeline that's going to come to us either way. So I hope that answers that. Um, yeah, let's let we could talk for a while. So I'll come back to you. Yes. Thanks very much. Have you noticed any interest by any government anywhere where you've spoken in any country? <laughs> Great question. Um, I I think that um, you know there is interest. But governments don't want to look out that far because it always becomes a budgetary question. However, I heard good news the other day that in Singapore, that the new airport terminal, the fifth terminal, I think it is, um, actually they're planning at five meters above sea level. They think farther, longer term in that part of the world. And uh, again, big infrastructure can last 100 years. Um, better safe than sorry. So it's a good example. San Francisco, I've, you know, I've testified for the Port, Port Authority there. I live in Florida. I've certainly had lots of meetings in Miami. But the challenge is most people just don't want to think out beyond 10, 10 years or 20 years at the worst. And sea level doesn't get bad in 10 or 20 years. It, um, but uh, as uh, Peter said, there's other flooding factors that sea level can exacerbate, fair enough. Okay, and certainly in, 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 the, in bays where the water uh, actually piles up in effect as it goes up a narrowing bay. That's where you're going to get the, the, the quick, you know, fatalities and the, and the serious flood events. But I'm trying to separate the weather and floods and storms from the sea level rise phenomena so that we don't confuse them. Okay, I'm just tease them apart a little bit. Up, anyway, in, the, up in the gallery. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think that even if we do do as much as we can to slow the sea level rise, we'd ever get back to the natural cycling that we saw, say, 200,000 years ago? Wow. Do I think that we could ever get back? You know, the word ever in science has a, a, an interesting question, okay? What's ever, you know? Uh, could we ever get back to it? Yes. The problem is human time scale is typically, you know, a century or maybe a thousand years. Uh, I don't think we can get back to the natural cycle this century. I do think that if we do get very aggressive about reducing greenhouse gases, that things will begin to rebalance. Okay, and I think that's a reasonable goal. And certainly, we should aim for the stars, in, in effect. And, you know, the, the higher the better. 
um, the more aggressive we get, and I use sea level again in the shoreline to drive the conversation. It's really about climate and weather change and the, hab the habitability of the planet. Our whole species has flourished in what scientists call the Holocene, the last 11,000 years. Remember the economist had a cover about five years ago. It said, welcome to the Anthropocene or Anthropocene. We're in the human-driven climate era. And so those eras, whether you go back to the Jurassic era or the Pleistocene or different geologic past, but all human civilizations flourished in the 11,400-year stable period called the Holocene. We're out of that. So can we get back to it? Yeah, probably, but we're going to need to be adaptive and creative. But humans are good at that. We don't have a choice. We can't go back to primitive life without electricity. We, that's not possible. I mean, we use technology for everything from, uh, you know, getting a haircut to, uh, you know, to getting some nice clothes, to let alone the laptops and all the things that we, we take for granted. Um, I think we have to use technology to solve the problems, but it's not a panacea. We're not going to get a quick fix. It's not going to restore things back to normal, but it will help us adapt. And I think that's what we have to do. Good. Right. We have a question yeah. sure. on um, the side. My question actually relates to, in a way, to the previous question. We were looking at your graph, 410 uh, parts per million CO2. Do, when, when did we, the Earth last have that sort of uh, CO2 uh, 10 million levels? years? Um, I think about 10 million years ago. Okay. Um, and do we know what was happening with the climate then, how it was, and how it was changing? Well, again, the, it, it, it's, there's a longer answer because the Earth has evolved. The amount of vegetation, the plants, of course, and, and the placement of the continents even, when you get into those time frames, yeah. the reflectance of the Earth. Okay, so there's limited value in going back to me, you know, bef I mean, except to prove that we know a lot about Earth history. But if we go back to that, that last ice age cycle or two, this 400,000 years, then we can, we can talk honestly, okay? When you get back into the historic times 100 million years ago when there was no ice on the planet, it's of limited value. It's an interesting academic. From my experience, now having done this for six or seven years straight, keep it focused, okay? And if we keep it focused to the natural ice age cycles, the, with people, again, they've, they've seen ice age part two, the meltdown. They know it's for real, okay? Um, so do you that, want me? That helps to, to define the discussion. Do yes. the front uh, I just would like to point out that uh, in the Bay of Cam Bay, they discovered 30 meter below sea level, these towns that they were originally built on the ground. And then they were raised to the elevated platforms of uh, by eight to nine feet because the sea level rose. And then they were suddenly abandoned. And I yeah. think the problem we have here is that how can you say that like uh, when the Arctic Ocean loses its snow and ice cover, that the whole green and ice sheet wouldn't be ex exhaustively accumulating meltwater in it and collapse in a l large lumps. As you can tell, Albert is a scholar and, and very much involved in this, and is, he's asking a fair question. Uh, again, when we start talking about the changing Arctic, we can say if this happens, we think this will happen. I mean... We're in a world where the changes go back hundreds of thousands of years, if not millions of years. It's very hard to decide what to look at. But the melting Arctic, which you two gentlemen um, you know, look at very closely, is very important and changes weather patterns. I didn't talk about that. As the Arctic sea ice disappears, one of the biggest effects is the changing weather patterns. The polar vortex uh, is because it's open ocean now instead of a layer of ice that, that traps the heat. So... Um, Good. Yes. Uh, we've probably got time just for two more questions. Can, uh, okay. can someone get a microphone to Janet, please? Better eyes than I do. See what people <laughs> it's quite hard, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um, I noticed on one of your slides that, um, and I don't remember the time scale on it, that Denmark as a country disappears entirely. Yes. Uh, I have a house that's disappearing into the sea in Denmark. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Where is it? In, in Denmark? Yes, okay. on the coast, yes. And so I was curious, given that perhaps an entire country is disappearing in this case, are they paying any more attention to this 
there, from what you can tell? Yes and no. I've been there a couple of times to Copenhagen and uh, talked about this with some hydrologic institutes, in fact, that, that look at this. Um, they are aware of flooding and they're concerned about it and they do modeling. But I found, uh, this was just two years ago when I was last there, that even there they were only looking at the IPCC scenarios uh, up to a meter. And so, uh, and I suggested they start looking at two meters as a possibility, um, which they thought was an innovative idea. They, uh, so I think people are waking up, okay? But we've gotten fooled because of, again, the, it's not recent history. We, uh, there's lots of constraints on this. But the good news is, again, I don't think anything radical can happen in the next 20 years or so. I really don't, okay? We have time to enjoy, to adapt, to build, to move, to sell, to, you know, do, do whatever we wish to do. I mean that. Be honest, you know? <laughs> um, so, but in, I always, as any good scientist, and you're all scientists, the fact that you're here tonight asking good questions and seeking the truth, you're all scientists. You want to base things on objective inf information, I believe, okay? The fact is, we've got to start with truth, okay? The, the fact that the water's rising or I'm getting older or, you know, that I have a, a terrible illness or something like that is, 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 it is what it is, you know? And all I can say is that people tend to overlook Denmark because it's small, but the whole, at 100 feet of sea level rise, the whole country disappears. They'll all move to Greenland, which they, is part of Denmark, <laughs> and Greenland won't do that. So uh, anyway. Great. We've got time for one more question. And the gentleman okay. here, three rows up, has been putting his hand up. So please. Thank you. Well, my question follows on from the previous one, except that one country that looks in terribly hazardous position from your map of showing what would get flooded as the sea level went up is Bangladesh. Yes. And a country like that um, is very vulnerable and they are not in a very good position to spend a lot of money doing something about it. So what happens with a country like that? You know as well as I. I mean, I'm not being flip, okay? It's a perfectly valid question. We could put Vietnam right alongside of it. We could put parts of uh, Pac uh, India's coast, uh, Calcutta, uh, Mumbai. Um, this is a huge problem. There are the nations in the Pacific and Indian Ocean where the whole country is going to go underwater, the islands, the Maldives, the uh, Tuvalu, and so on. Okay, I used to live in the Bahamas a good part of my life. Most of that country will disappear. This is a, pre this is a problem we have never faced before. There is no good answer to your question, okay? But the humanitarian, the national security, the immigration, the, the food supply uh, aspects of this are tremendous. And we are not looking at it squarely. The fact that, again, uh, to close on that question, though, I really applaud you for making the effort to come here tonight, for getting informed, uh, whether you sign up for my blog or buy my book, but... Um, you're now part of a team, if you will, my team, and I'm not signing you up, but engaging you to take the message to the next level. Because you, I think every one of you would agree that most people do not understand this. This is part of climate change. As I said, remember, I had the energy uh, part in the, in the black sphere. I had the orange with the different effects from agriculture to water to weather. But sea level is special, and it gets people's attention because it's real estate. It's their assets. It's their biggest investment. It's the most tangible thing in the world is real estate, right? We thought it was the quantity was fixed. They used to say when I was a kid, buy real estate. They're not making any more of it. Well, they're starting to take it away, whoever they is, okay? We're going to deal with less real estate. We thought except for coastal erosion that that couldn't happen wholesale, or large scale. It is going to happen. So is that the worst thing you've ever heard in your life? Probably not. Is it the best thing? Of course not. But the truth is, like any scientific enlightenment, whether it be explaining magnetism or greenhouse gases or anything that's happened here for 220 years, facts are facts. And let's try and deal with them. And again, I, I, make, I try and personalize this. You know, again, how long will I live? I don't know. I hope I live for another 30 or 40 years. I have a daughter who's 18. But we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. But we can plan the best we can, and we can teach. 
and we can get politically active, not in the sense of overthrowing governments, although I know that's kind of discussed here in Britain all the time now. <laughs> um, that, uh, sorry. A um, little bit of levity, see, good. Um, that this is a unique problem. Most people don't understand the problem, and it's places like the Royal Institution, thank goodness, that brings scientists and puts things in plain language and gets the word out, which is what you've been doing here for over two centuries, and is so important because, unfortunately, most scientists don't communicate well. They're too much into their detail. Um, and we have to find ways to translate and to get the glaciologists talking to the insurers and the bankers and the engineers and the architects. And that's, again, what our institute's going to do. And, and again, if, if you either know sources of funding or know people who might help get the International Sea Level Institute either with an office here and we're going to hire some people or based here, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it. Um, I, I mean, there's several other possibilities, but... It's that worthy an idea. We need a place to go for good information, for best practices, and people who are staffed to teach this to the engineers, the architects, the attorneys, uh, the, the economists. So thank you again. You've been a wonderful audience, and I really appreciate it. <laughs>